This program is made possible in part by a grant from Charlotte Metcalf, dedicated to recognizing the work of the Metcalf Institute at the University of Rhode Island. 5.6 million Americans live with Alzheimer's today. Another 100,000 are estimated to be living with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. Today's guest is a brain scientist whose novels describe not what it's like to die from these diseases, but what it's like to live with them. She's Lisa Genova this week on Story in the Public Square. Welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. We do that by visiting each week with the best contemporary storytellers, authors, scholars, filmmakers, and journalists, really anyone using or studying narrative to explain the world in which we live. This week, we're joined by best-selling author Lisa Genova, a Harvard-trained neuroscientist. Her books show the reader what it's like to live with neurological disease and conditions. Her latest novel is Every Note Played. Lisa, we're thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you, Jim. Now, our audience probably doesn't know this, but you were actually our very first guest on a pilot where we really learned how not to produce a television show. <laughs> yeah. So we're not thrilled. Not because of anything you did, It wasn't what you did, it was what we did. Uh, and we just want to thank you for coming back. Oh my God, I'm thrilled to see you guys again. Thanks for having me. Well, so, uh, you know, you have this remarkable biography, a Harvard-trained neuroscientist uh, who has found this calling this life uh, in storytelling, in fiction in particular. What drew you to fiction? Yeah, it's a really weird career path for a neuroscientist. I don't know any other neuroscientists who write novels. Um, it really began with my grandmother. She was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in the late 90s. And I come from a really large Italian family. We live up in the Boston area. And as the neuroscientist in this big family, I figured it was probably my responsibility to understand this neurological disease as best as possible and pass that education along to my aunts who were her primary caregivers. And so I learned everything I could about this disease. So I learned about the molecular neurobiology, I learned about the clinical management, I learned about the disease progression and the symptoms, I learned about caregiving. But in all of that education, it lacked the answer to this question. What does it feel like to have Alzheimer's? And that was the question that was haunting me because I could understand her as a neuroscientist, but after, even after all that education, I still had no idea how to understand her as a granddaughter. I didn't know how to simply be with her. And while all of us had lots of sympathy for her, so it was I could feel really bad for my grandmother and all the memories she was losing and all of the, that, the identity and the confusion and the bewilderment and it was heartbreaking and so upsetting and unnerving and it made us all really uncomfortable and we felt bad for her and we felt bad for us but I didn't know how to feel with her and that's the distinction between sympathy and empathy and I had this intuitive thought which was well fiction is the place where you can explore empathy stories give us the chance to walk in someone else's shoes and so I thought well there, that book didn't exist and so I thought, well, maybe I'll write a book about a woman with Alzheimer's and tell it from her perspective. And maybe then I'll get this insight, this empathy that I was searching for. And so the, the, the science, knowing the science, understanding the clinical uh, mm -hmm. presentation of these diseases is one thing. How do you do the research to get into understanding really what it's like to live with, whether we're talking about ALS in your most recent book or, or Alzheimer's or any of the other brain conditions and diseases you've, you've written about? Right, thanks. So yes, I've written about Alzheimer's, traumatic brain injury, autism, Huntington's disease, and ALS. And for all of them, it's, it's sort of the same kind of research. So I read everything I can from the very scientific, most current research papers to the medical textbooks. Um, to the first person accounts, to the caregiver's point of view. Then I go into the medical community and I want to know er, er, anyone who touches that patient. So the, the neurologists, the nurses, 
the, um, the care specialists, the OTs, the PTs, speech pathologists, anyone, but then I get to know the real experts, and it's the people who have it. And so, for example, with Still Alice, I came to know 27 people still in the early stages of Alzheimer's who could communicate what it feels like to have it. And I was in touch with them every day for the year and a half that I was writing Still Alice. So they really give me the insights. And it's amazing that these folks share with me what's going on with them at the most vulnerable, uncertain times of their lives. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It's, it's such an honor and a privilege, and it really instills in me a sense of enormous responsibility to give their story, their journey, a face and a voice. Because for so many people diagnosed with these diseases and conditions, you know, people don't want to talk about Alzheimer's. You know, it's scary or it's depressing or I just, I don't really understand, you know, autism or ALS. And so it makes me uncomfortable. And what do we, we human beings hate to be uncomfortable. So if I'm not familiar with that and it's a little scary, I'm probably just going to not look at it. And so <clears throat> if we're talking about Alzheimer's, I've just turned my back on about 50 million people worldwide. And so people, in addition to going through something like Alzheimer's or ALS, they also have to deal with the burden of the stigma and the shame and the isolation on top of it all. And, and we can do something about that. And so in getting to know people who have it, it humanizes it for me instantly. It's like now I know real people who have this. For, um, for every note played, I got to know 12 people with ALS. And um, that was a really intense journey with that book. Um, eight of the 12 died before I finished the mm. final draft. So these conversations are intimate and deep and really get to the complexity of, of what it's like to live and die with some of these things. Are people more, uh, is it easier to find people to talk to now <laughs> than when you were writing your first book? Oh yeah, well so now, I'm, like the first one I was, it wasn't necessarily that hard in the beginning because I had this PhD in neuroscience from Harvard which turned out to be really helpful. Um, it lent some credibility to me even though I'd never written a novel. It was, they knew I was coming from a place of, you know, being well trained and I was asking the right kinds of questions. But now I'm kind of a known thing. So I get like bombarded on Facebook and Instagram or if I'm at a book huh. event they're like, so, like, I've got this thing. <laughs> like, will you write about that? Or if I happen to mention, so, like, right now I'm writing a nonfiction book about memory. Um, but after that, my next novel will be about someone with bipolar disorder. And oh, wow. so a lot of people wow. are coming out saying, oh, yeah, like, we, we know that. And if you need our help, let us know. Wow. Yeah. I want to go back to why you decided to write fiction. You could have done a memoir. Yep. You could have done a how-to, a caregiver's guide. You could have done a book like Daniela Lamas, who is a physician at Brigham and Women's, who mm -hmm. wrote You Can Stop Humming Now, which yeah. was an actual account of her experiences and patients. But you chose fiction. And you said something before we began taping that struck me. And you said story with empathy is the best way to learn. Talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. What you can bring <clears throat> in fiction that you may not be able to bring it's as well or even at all in nonfiction. Yeah, so the experience is a little different. And I've just spent the last year traveling around the nation giving this very talk, which is that story, especially told through the lens of empathy, is the most powerful way to learn anything. And so it, there's some neuroscience to this too. So we have neurons in our brains called mirror neurons. And these neurons become activated only when I have empathy for what you are experiencing. So if, you know, whether it's, you know, if I saw you take a sip of water right now, the neurons in charge of the motor plan for taking a drink of water in my brain get activated when I watch you do that. And so my neurons mimic your behavior, but it doesn't just stop there. I also infer your internal state. So I'll think you must be thirsty. That's why you did that. And then through changes in my, I'll undergo some changes in my internal state that mimic what you're going through, and so I might feel thirsty. So that's a very simple example, but it could have to do with anything, right? So it can be, you know, if you're in anguish, my mirror neurons will get activated and I'll, I'll get in sync with your experience. So, you know, in so many ways neurologically, we're wired to experience each other as similar, not different, which is kind of wild given what our world is looking like, like right now. <laughs> yeah, but, you think? You know, so, 
but it, but wildly enough, I love this, in um, neurophysiological studies or in brain imaging studies, we see that these mirror neurons that get in sync with the subjective experience, the emotional experience of someone else, also become activated when you read fiction. And specifically fiction, not necessarily nonfiction or, or other kinds of text. So there's something about, about Li reading and living through someone else's story that allows you to actually experience the full emotional context of what that might be like. And again, it collapses the di distance. So if I read a memoir, I still might, f I'll feel probably a lot of sympathy. Oh, that poor person, that's awful. You know, how many of you dumped buckets of ice water over your head for the ice bucket challenge for ALS? Like those poor people with ALS. And maybe you've seen you know, Stephen Hawking back when he was alive on the news, or Pete Frates, or Steve Gleason, and, and you see them in the, in the wheelchair, and they're hooked up to a tracheostomy mm. tube, and you're like, wow, that's awful. That's sympathy. You know, after I did the ice bucket challenge, I felt cold, but that was about it in terms of feeling. And then I like, posted it to Facebook, donated some money. I felt good about me for doing that. People liked it. It was fun. I moved on with my day. I didn't really have to think about what, or feel what it could be like to have ALS for a second. But through story, it can inhabit you. And I can now feel what it feels like to have ALS. And that sticks with you. So you can intellectually understand something about a disease. I can understand Alzheimer's as a disease where you have dementia and you lose your memories. And I can understand some statistics that 5.7 million Americans have it. But that just lives there. And it doesn't really change me or motivate me to, to care about you in an empathetic way. I'll feel sympathy. And you're, oh, you're otherized. Right? If I have sympathy, you're different than I am. So you're over there, and I'm over here. But if I read a story, it's not just intellectual anymore. It's, it's like from the heart space. It's feeling. And then it collapses that distance, and I can feel with you instead of for you. And that's empathy. And now you're not different than I am. So, you know, it's, it's sort of roughly parallel to telling a story in person. You know, I, think, I, I sometimes use this analogy. You come home at the end of the day and you see your significant other, your partner, your ch child, whatever. You say, you tell that person what happened during the day and you ask that person what happened to him or her. There's that emotional connection person to person that would be very different if you came home and like sent a text to your kid and said what happened, which by the way you might do. But, no, no, right. but, but is that not sort of what we're talking about here, the emotional yeah. connection, the power? Well, because in story, hopefully, especially in a narrative like a novel, there's so much richness and detail I can provide to you. So to give you all those sensory moment to moment details, so it's the richness of that experience, right? So a text is just this two dimensional flat, it's it's linguistic, it's words, and it's it can be interpreted. I don't know the tone of that, and that can be misconstrued, yeah. in fact. But if you're in front of me, I'm not just getting the words that you say. I'm getting the, the magic that happens in eye contact. I'm getting your energy. I'm getting your intention. It's it, There's so much more that's communicated. And you can do that in fiction, clearly, obviously. And fiction can allow obviously. that to happen, yeah. yeah. It's it, pretty amazing. So, so every note played is a remarkable a remarkable story and a remarkable Thank novel, you, and um, I, I, I'll say with 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 no embarrassment that it it moved me uh, to tears on a number of in a number of passages. Yeah. There's some just real raw stuff that you that you unpack about yep. living with ALS. Uh, how so? Um, so you get that from the people you talk to, but does that? itself take a, so like, I, you know, I'm, I'm reading this book and I can get to the end of that chapter and sort of take a breather. Yeah. yeah. You're living with this writing it. How, what, the, what kind of toll does it take on you emotionally in, in, in sharing these stories? Yeah, so I get this question a lot and people say, you know, you write about all these like really difficult, tragic diseases, like are you depressed? Is it, how do you manage that? And interestingly, I don't find these books depressing. So hold on for a sec, because this was an intense story, especially to write. So the folks I came to know with ALS, you know, eight of the 12 died before I finished the, the last draft. And, and these are folks I came to know and love. I'm around them regularly. They're sharing their most intimate selves with me. So they really open their souls and sharing with me things like, you know, what's their greatest fear, their greatest regret. So life, ex just so folks know, like, Life expectancy following a diagnosis of ALS is three years. 
So Stephen Hawking was an outlier, and in fact, he would have died 55 years ago had he not had that tracheostomy surgery and gone on 24 7, 365 day a year life support, which is extremely expensive and life threatening all the way through. So most people die pretty quickly of this disease. So it's like, okay, the clock is ticking. What haven't I done? Um, who haven't I said sorry to? Who haven't I, my, can I make sure the people I love know I love them? What's my legacy going to be? And then the fear or the anger of you know being deprived the time that you thought you were gonna have because this disease comes out of the blue. Um, you usually start with like a weakness in your hand. Like, oh, what is that? Did I just, you know, is it from tennis? Is it from writing too much? Is it like, what is it? And it gets weaker and weaker and eventually it becomes paralyzed and the paralysis doesn't stop, it keeps going. So you eventually, your entire body, all of your voluntary muscles become paralyzed. So eventually you can't walk, you can't feed yourself or toilet yourself, you can't speak, you can't breathe. So it's a hideous progression. Um, and so we're having these conversations and I, I form real intimate loving bonds with these folks and it's awful, it's devastating. So that's the, the tragedy and the horror of these diseases are there. And yet, don't we all wanna be in relationships with folks and know people really? Like how many of us walk through our days with like, how you doing, Jim? You good? Right, right. How's your family? You good? Yeah, Everybody nobody, good? Yeah, there's no, there's no right, good to see you. Yeah, yeah. And that's it. So these relationships get incredibly intimate and, and con connected on a soul level. And um, I feel a great honor and privilege to know someone like that in such a fearful moment in their lives. Um, and so when I sit down to write the emotion, it, it, at times it's cathartic. Um, and then other times it's like, it's okay. I, like, I don't know, I'm Italian, I don't mind crying. Or, <laughs> but it's just, like, I feel a great sense of both responsibility and opportunity and, and, and honor to write these stories in a way that is truthful and with dignity and to like pull back the curtain and not sugarcoat it. Yeah. This stuff is real, these folks are going through and I, I wanna let you know what it is so that it's not just the guy in the suit and the wheelchair on the news and he's all buttoned up and pretty and he's breathing and it looks like, well that's not so bad. It's like, no, you took four hours to get him in that chair and, and, it, it's, and it's awful. Well, and, and I wanna be clear, I didn't think that the book was depressing at all. Yeah, but there is a there's a there's a rawness and a raw is the word. Yeah, yeah. That and and is just and these folks are compelling. you know most people and, and it's like there's a selected group I've got right so I've got folks who are raising their hair and saying like despite the fact that I've got this hideous diagnosis that's taken me down I've got enough res reserve to offer my help to you yeah. like they have that generosity of spirit and that sense of like how can I help someone else oh my God, that person is an inspiring, resilient, amazing human being. And so I become a better person with every book I write because these are the kinds of people I'm surrounding myself with. They've chosen to and they have the, the resiliency to frame their situation in such a way that it doesn't entirely sink them. And they look for ways that you know, people don't live the tragedy of their diagnosis 24 seven, nobody does. Um, and so a lot of these folks say, okay, this is what I've got, it's awful, and yet what can I still do while I'm here? Like how can I be all that I am every day and appreciate that and have gratitude and love and, and do all the things that all of us are supposed to be appreciative of every day, but we think we have forever, right? Like, ah, I'm gonna die later. And we think it's gonna be, you know, hopefully, you know, as an elderly person in, in your sleep at night. Right. But, you know, the clock is ticking for everybody. It just becomes exquisitely real for a lot of these folks. And then they live in kind of heroic ways oftentimes. So you touched on this, and I'm hoping you can get into it a little more deeply. What motivates people to share their stories with you? I mean, it probably, I'm sure it varies person by person, but can you sort of generalize? Yeah. I mean, I a, lot of, a lot of people might say, I don't want to share this with a stranger. You're, you're a stranger when you certainly first arrived. Yeah. So long way of asking, what do you think motivates these yeah, people? Yeah, well, I think for people who don't want to share, I haven't met them. But for the yeah. people who want to, it's, um, I think the motivation in part becomes from, you know, if we're talking about Alzheimer's or ALS or Huntington's, like these are diseases that are diminishing you and quieting you and squirreling you away because people don't understand what's going on. They don't really want to look at you. So you're becoming invisible. And I think as human beings, 
our birthright is to be seen and heard. We want to be connected. Like loneliness is one of the worst things to experience. Mm. And I think that people with Alzheimer's or ALS get excluded from community. They become otherized. And I think that in talking to me, it's I'm giving them a stage and a microphone. Tell me, tell me what's going on with you. What does this feel like? I want to know. Um, I'm going to write it down and I'm going to share it with the world. And I think there's that piece too that there's a, that there's a sense I'm helping by doing this because we know that, you know, Still Alice is a great example. Like Maria Shriver said when this became a film, she said. I think and hope that still Alice will do for Alzheimer's what Philadelphia did for AIDS. Like by telling these stories, we p drag these diseases and conditions out of the closet, we dis demystify them, we humanize them, and we give people a vehicle for conversation. And conversation fuels social change. So we're not going to get to treatments and survivors if nobody's talking about it, right? It's much like cancer was 50 years ago when people called it right? Yeah, Nobody absolutely. did. And we didn't have treatments. And we didn't have survivors. And it's no coincidence that we do now because now we wear the looped ribbons and we talk about it and we pull people back into community who have it. So for, for you know, and we, we tend to treat, you know, illnesses and conditions of the neck up very different than the neck down. There's something about mental illness and neurodegenerative diseases and neurological conditions where people get really wigged out and like just, it's so unfamiliar and they just can't deal with it. So for the people who have it, I think part of the reason they talk to me is they want, they know that those folks aren't going to read about their ALS in the Journal of Neuroscience. And like the, the way in is through story. And so if I can tell some of their story, this is a way for not just understanding them, because it might be too late for them, but this is a way to help the next guy who gets diagnosed or their children who might now be genetically prone to this. Um, and it might also just help raise the world's consciousness about this illness and, and get the urgency and the conversation going so that we can actually make a, a change. Well, so when you, so you're, you've described yourself, uh, when we talked to you the last time, yeah. as, as an advocate on these issues. Yeah. The, your, 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 your publication, but also the things that you do beyond publication, yeah. draws attention to these issues. How are we, when we think about the public policy around something like Alzheimer's, how are we doing as a society? And I think I know the answer, but do we need to be doing more? So yes, we need to be doing more, and we're doing a heck of a lot more than we were 10 years ago. So we just put out the 10-year anniversary edition of Still Alice, and, and in that journey, it was I, I add some bonus material into the book, and I, I talk about sort of like what's been going on in the field in terms of both research and public policy and advocacy and who's throwing their hats into the ring and are we collaborating? And so there's more money, there's more collaboration. It's not just NIH, we're not just waiting around for the government to fix this. It's like Bill Gates threw his hat in the ring and Maria Shriver and I work on, on this issue a lot. Um, there's Us Against Alzheimer's in Washington, D.C. There's the Cure Alzheimer's Fund, there's the Judy Fund and everybody's collaborating. And the, the Alzheimer's Association, of course, is like, you know, the mothership on this. But um, I think that that the alarms have been sounding. So, you know, the number one risk factor for Alzheimer's is age. We've got the baby boomers coming into like prime risk for Alzheimer's. Um, so we're at, you know, almost 50 million people worldwide and it's just gonna escalate exponentially. So, you know, it's right now your risk of Alzheimer's. So you want to live to be an old guy? Yeah, you want to yeah, yeah. be 85? Yeah. You've got a one in three, rapidly approaching one in two chance of having Alzheimer's at 85. Wow. And then I'm like, all right, if you think it's not you, yeah. then you're a caregiver. Yeah. So this is not a good this is not a good price to pay for longevity. So I think that everybody's finally getting like this is gonna be the emotional, physical financial sinkhole of this next century if we don't do something about well, this. And you, so you mentioned sort of the the, the, the odds. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you've got a uh, TED talk uh, yeah. that four million people have watched where you describe in general terms what people can do to prevent yeah. Alzheimer's. People should go watch the TED talk, but you. you know, in shorthand, what should people be doing? Right, so people are sort of like waiting around for the magic pill and you know, hopefully we'll have the magic pill, but in the meantime, we have really good scientific data that shows that some pretty like low tech, not very sexy things can significantly reduce your risk of this disease. So you can't do anything about getting older, you can't do anything about the genes you inherited from mom and dad, and by the way, for 98% of you, 
your Alzheimer's is not determined by what you inherited. So you'll have some genes that will increase your risk, but some will actually protect you. So that's just done. You can't change that. But what about cardiovascular health? Does that affect your risk of Alzheimer's? Yeah, a lot. So we know that um, Mediterranean diet, uh, exercise, aer especially aerobic exercise, um, uh, you don't want high blood pressure, high cholesterol, don't smoke. And you said um, sleep. Right? Diabetes, don't have, like, so sleep. So, yeah. So this, the data on this are so compelling, it's ri ri ridiculous. Like, we already have basically one of the magic pills for Alzheimer's, and it's free. It's called sleep. So we know that during slow-wave deep sleep, these cells in your brain called glial cells, they're like the janitors of your brain. They clear away the metabolic debris that accumulated while you were in the business of being awake. It's like the sewage sanitation department of your brain. And one of the things that clears away while you sleep is this protein called amyloid beta. And that's sort of the bad guy that when it piles up enough, it forms plaques. And when it reaches a certain point, it then triggers like the molecular cascade, the runaway train that will be Alzheimer's. But before it accumulates to that tipping point, you don't have Alzheimer's. So you want to keep clearing it away. But what happens if you don't get enough sleep? If you don't get enough of the slow wave deep sleep, you haven't cleared it all away, and so you've got amyloid beta accumulating unnecessarily. So it's it's a minimum of seven hours a night is what all the studies show. And so quality sleep too. Yeah, preferably. yeah. And so honestly, like the world's thought leaders in Alzheimer's, like the world-renowned scientists that are investigating Alzheimer's, have taken this seriously, and they used to, you know, not get you know, burn the candle at both ends for years. They're like, uh-uh. Lisa Genova, we're out of time. We need to leave it there. But thank you so much for being uh, with us. Thank you. It was great. She's Lisa Genova. The new book is Every Note Played. You should check it out. That's all the time we have this week. But if you want to know more about storing the public square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org where you can always catch up on previous episodes. He's Wayne. I'm Jim, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square. This program is made possible in part by a grant from Charlotte Metcalf, dedicated to recognizing the work of the Metcalf Institute at the University of Rhode Island.